Hello, I'm Wendy. Today we're painting a winter landscape from a photograph. It's a demonstration painting and I'm calling it part two. Part two because um, if you follow my channel you'll know that um, my last video I painted a winter landscape from a photograph that was had quite a lot in common with this photograph that I'm showing you now that I'm going to paint from today. They were both taken in the same area near where I live on the same day and so we've got very similar tones and colours in the photograph. Working from the first photograph I use sponge work to sort out the detail and the texture and everything that was showing through the snow. Now on this second one we don't have any of that going on but we do have some lovely tangles of brambles in the foreground which can be quite challenging to paint but um, I quite enjoy experimenting and um, painting those sorts of um, areas so I hope this is going to be of some help to you if you want to tackle a similar subject. This was the rough sketch that I made just putting in the major elements that are in the painting and not worrying too much about details. I hadn't painted this picture before so what you're seeing is the first time I painted it so I will be experimenting, working out what to do, building up the picture. So again I hope you um, find that interesting and also I do hope it helps you if you're tackling scenes like this which are pretty complicated and you've got to sort of break them down into their individual elements and work around your picture basically. It's really useful not to have too much of a preconceived idea of what your painting is going to look like. I know we're going to want it to look like the photograph because we like the photograph but we're never going to get it exactly the same and watercolour is always going to do its own thing. So when you're applying the paint try to work along with the watercolour and adjust your thinking as you're working and not be too bothered about painting exactly what's in front of you. And I was thinking about this while I was doing this painting. Another thing that helps me is if I'm actually, if I'm doing a painting and I'm putting an area down that I've painted and I think, oh, that's not quite right. I really don't like that. I don't think that's going to work. And then you start changing it. What I suggest is don't change it. If you put down an area you're not keen on, leave it. Work around your picture because sometimes when you go back to it, you'll find it did work after all. And it is much better than constantly chopping and changing areas as you're working. What I'm trying to say is work around your picture. Don't finish areas. If there are areas you don't like, leave them till later on. And then you might find you just need to make some minor adjustments. I'm using a similar palette to what I did on the last painting. And I'm using Burnt Umber, Raw Sienna, Payne's Grey. Um, I might have used a touch of light red in there, but I think that was all I used. If I, if I remember any more, I'll let you know. I'm showing you some of the mixes as I go along as well. So that might help you, particularly on this wet into wet work, because um, I know people are struggling with it. I put on a background of Payne's Grey with a touch of brown, a little bit of blue in there. Maybe you just want a very light sky. And then while that's wet, you want to put in your distant trees. You can see the sort of mix that I've got there. It's quite a stiff mix. And it's all about practice, this wet into wet work. You've got to have the background still wet. You've got to have the mix that you're putting on, the right tones and the right strength. While it is wet, as you can see here, you can go in and put a little bit of darker paint on there. You don't want to put anything lighter because if you do you'll get those horrible cauliflowers and awful run backs in, in the work. If you want to you can always sprinkle a little bit of salt into those background trees as I did here. You can see how it's drying. Now I did use some masking fluid on this. Um, I like to use masking fluid rather than gouache. I have said it before I find the gouache and some of the opaque whites quite difficult to use. They can get quite blobby and um, I like to see the paper in a watercolour. I like to see 
the white paper standing for the snow rather than putting an opaque colour on it. So what I'm doing here is I'm just putting on some of the snow that's sitting on the brambles and sitting on the bramble leaves. So I'm just putting on some random patches of the masking fluid. The masking fluid is PBO, there's a link in the description box. I find this is the best masking fluid um, and I've been painted for a long time and this is the one that works the best for me. It's thin, it goes on very well, it dries quickly, doesn't go too globby in the tube and it's not terribly expensive. So I'm carrying on here just um, dotting some of the masking fluid here and there where I think it might be nice to have the, the white patches of snow. I put a little bit on the tree trunks. Now with hindsight I should have um, put some on the tree trunks higher up before I put the background sky and trees on. So um, I will have to put a little bit of masking um, Sorry, I will have to put a little bit of gouache on those trunks, the higher parts of the trunks, towards the end of the painting. Working on a landscape, I generally work from the background to the foreground. And so the next stage for me here was this... Um, hedgerow with the trees growing out. Now looking at the photograph that I've put up here, you can see those trees that I'm tackling now were, were quite light against those distant trees, but this was one of the stages where I thought I'm going to get far too fussy, far too detailed, go into all sorts of problems here. I think those light trees against the dark background would make a painting on their own. So what I did here was I used um, a darker mix, as you can see, to put the trees in over the background there. I used dry brush technique. The mix is quite stiff, as you can see from the right hand side, and I'm using the side of the brush. Trying to vary, I noticed they're all the same height, so I was varying a little bit. Um, as I was putting them on, I was thinking, oh, these are too dark, these are too dark. Um, but as I said in the introduction to the video, don't change things, leave them alone, just keep on working. I didn't want the picture to be too cold. Um, there is a lot of blue in it, bluey greys, so there is the burnt sienna in the mix there. And you've got the trees and you've got the sort of hedgerow underneath. And the tree trunks growing up into the trees. So it's as we always say when you're painting it's all about observation, looking at what interests you and I'm always quite drawn to these areas, these hedgerows and all the branches and the tangles growing out of them. So I really liked that area. As I said I could make a little study or a painting just of that. You could zoom in on the photograph, do the hedgerow, do the light tree against the darker backgrounds. That would be quite interesting. Um, maybe I'll do that, just not enough hours in the day. So here I've got quite a dark mix, as you can see, to put in the, um, the trunks on the trees there and the little bit of twigs and foliage and stuff that's growing out of the hedgerow. Again, um, looking at this, I, it was observation. I zoomed in on the photograph um, to give me some ideas on how to do this. I put the shadows across the snow with a mix of cobalt blue and just a touch of brown. And as you can see, it's a very watery mix there. And I looked at the reference again and um, and place them where I thought would look the best, if you like. You don't want to put too many of the shadows in the foreground because that's got to be kept quite white. You have got the masking fluid on there, 
so that's going to help but I think what I did was I didn't bring it down over all the brambles just where there seemed to be a gap in them as you can see there and you probably notice that I've been ignoring the trees all this time that's because they're going to be dark against a lighter background and in that case really you can ignore them till the end you might need to reinforce pencil marks sometime but those background trees that I put on there they're fairly dark and I worry well I don't worry <laughs> I don't worry I'm a bit concerned that if you put the um, the dark on there you're going to you're going to see them sort of sort of coming through the the trees and you're going to have a lighter area at the bottom and a darker area at the top and you don't want that so what I'm trying to get around to saying in a very roundabout way is what I like to do is pull out the colour where the trunks are going to be and then you can get an even colour on your tree trunks the way I do that is using a little flat brush and I rinse it in water and then I take most of the water off using a tissue and then as you can see with these um, brush strokes up and down then I pull out the paint so I'm rinsing it off drying it off and then pulling out the paint and for me that works really well you could um, do this method if you wanted lighter trees as well you obviously can't get back right to the white of the paper but you can get back far enough so you could put the light trees on after you've worked the dark backgrounds over them I worked the tree trunks and the branches in a similar way to the ones that I, I painted on the last painting, the last um, painting demonstration. I start off by putting um, a sort of a mid-tone on there and then dropping in some, some darker mixes and um, putting some little strokes on to make sure that um, we're not ending up with um, really straight edges on the trees because they will have little bumps on them and little branches growing out and it just looks more natural if you don't have them looking too straight. And I didn't want to forget the fence post because I think that is a really nice part of the composition, isn't it? It sort of balances the two trees on the left. So I carried on painting the branches and the little twigs on the tree in a similar way to what I did on the last painting, using quite a strong mix of our browns and using a rigger quite often in places I will put a branch coming out from the main trunk um, which is quite dark but then what you want to do is you want to blend in that dark on the tree trunk in the way that I'm doing now it also makes the the trunk look more interesting and it doesn't look as obvious that you've just painted a, a branch on the tree trunk you're blending in the brush marks and then this is an older tree and you've got lots of very very tiny little twigs on the end of the smaller branches where you've got some cones and some catkins I had to read up all about alders I was quite interested in in these um, little bits and bobs that were on the end there and I, I didn't have a clue I'm terrible really I'm I'm not very good on trees at all I'm good on pretty good on flowers and birds but I've never been very good on trees so do correct me in the comments if I'm wrong but I'm pretty certain these trees were alders and you do get these nice little cones and um, as I said catkins on the end and I think it does add a lot of interest to the picture 
if you're painting winter trees, they can look rather dead. And so I think just adding something like this to them makes them more interesting. So now it was the foreground and I wanted to put um, a bit more warmth in here because um, it would bring the, the foreground forward, throw the distance back as we all know. And so I used quite a bit of the brown to start off with in the mix. And I'm basically just keeping an eye on the reference for shapes, um, but I'm basically just dotting around some colour to stand for the bracken. That was in there and some of the leaves. We've got the masking fluid on so that makes it much easier I think to to do these sort of foregrounds and as you can see from the mix I'm varying the tones and the strength of the browns in there by adding a bit of Payne's Grey to darken it. I speeded the next little bit up again because it's quite repetitive as you can see it's just dotting around and putting in more of the uh, the leaves and the brambles. It's very important I think when you're doing this, the colour's important clearly but I think it's more important to get some lights and darks working there so this this change of tone will suggest that you've got some depth and um, it, it will help not making the foreground looking too flat. I put some of the brambles on using um, a rigger with a very dark mix as you can see and I didn't want to overdo it at all which I do tend to do sometimes. You can see here now how it's um, shaping up when I've rubbed the masking fluid off. It does make quite a bit of difference. It's not too distracting the colour of the masking fluid, but you can see the difference just getting rid of that sort of light blue tinge. And then you've got the um, all these shapes that are now standing as the uh, snow falling on the leaves. And at this stage, sometimes a bit earlier, I like to put a a long mount around it, it does give you an idea of how the picture's progressing. And quite often at this stage I might leave it on just to help me with um, final details and sorting out the composition. So a very light blue shadowy colour I'm putting on here underneath the, uh, the areas of snow. And I, I always think this works really well, it just changes those white shapes into something. It just seems to change them into lumps of snow just by putting a little bit of blue underneath them. I found it a bit tricky judging the blue. I went back in and uh, made it a little bit brighter. A little bit of rigor work, not too much, just to suggest some twigs overlapping the, the mounds, little mounds of snow there. And then at this stage I used some opaque white. I didn't want to use a lot, as I said at the beginning of the video. I did need to put some little specks of snow higher up on the trunks because I hadn't massed those out. So this is where the, uh, the opaque white comes in very useful. It also is extremely useful for putting on the branches. Um, it'd be very difficult, I think, to mask the... I would have found it difficult to mask these out because I wasn't sure where they were going to go, a lot of these branches, and where I put them was quite random. But it is useful at this stage to put the, the white gouache on to, um, as I said, to stand for the snow that settled on them and to show some overlapping as well of the branches and the twigs. So I've sped this um, this little bit up again.
looking at it as I'm doing this now, I'm thinking that the um, using the masking fluid in the foreground was the best way to go because um, I just think it looks much nicer seeing the white of the paper for those larger areas of snow and then using the opaque white for on the branches. And you'll see that I, um, I popped a little bit of the opaque white over the uh, little catkins and things so it looked as if the snow had settled on them. I think the green of the bramble leaves makes a nice contrast against the, uh, the browns and the greys that are going on. That sort of green that I'm using there, I will have mixed from burnt sienna with Prussian blue and possibly a bit of sap green to make it a little bit brighter. But you could use cobalt or ultramarine with one of your yellows. Just practice it. Um, and do some little swatches on test swatches on a bit of paper um, just to make sure you get it right. You don't want it too bright. You don't want it too bright and too spring like. And don't use any green straight out of tubes, whatever you do. Do your own mixing. I do have videos on mixing greens, so um, I'll put some links in the description box below. I felt the hedgerow at the back was getting a little bit lost um, so I reinforced it um, with some darker browns as you can see and those trees in the distance actually were seemed to work all right so I'm glad I didn't mess around with them. I put in some taller grasses with a rigger as you can see because I felt I needed to link up the foreground with the middle ground I could have left it at that, but, um, and I did take a photograph in case this went wrong. I thought splattering would not come amiss and it would add something to the picture and um, a little bit of snow falling. And I think, think that was a good decision. I quite liked it in the end. So as always, um, I hope you enjoyed watching the video and listening to my ramblings at times. I hope some of the techniques that I demonstrated will help you in your own landscape paintings. Bye for now and do subscribe to my channel if you don't want to miss anything that's coming up next year now.